Hi everybody, it's Thomas. Out on an uh, early Saturday morning, well relatively early, it's about 10 o'clock. Uh, which meant that I was up relatively early for me these days. It was supposed to be uh, cloudy all day, but looks like the gods have decided to be more clement. Out for a little stroll through a part of the city that most of you will be pretty familiar with. Uh, maybe taking some unexpected detours, or at least unfamiliar ones, uh, along the way. And right behind me here is a French church. Now you'll see what's uh, you'll see what what it's on top of here in just a minute. Uh, the church is called Holy Trinity on the Mount, and uh, goes back to the 16th century. But here it's up on top of some steps, uh, but not just these ones. even up on top of these rather more famous steps that we'll be going down in a minute. Uh, we call them the Spanish steps, although the Spanish had nothing to do with them at all. This is a part of the city that uh, relatively new, certainly by Roman standards. The hill that we're on, the Pynchon Hill, was in ancient times called the Hill of the Gardens. You had uh, noble aristocratic families with their sophisticated suburban spreads. And of course, all through what we call the Middle Ages, you know, Rome a shadow of its former self. That population down from a high of well over a million to, you know, an average of about 30 to 40,000. Now that, that population in the Middle Ages could jump up. It could also drop far down as well. From that 30 to 40,000. This is all built up in the period of the rebirth of Rome. Well, in English, we just use the French word Renaissance, Renaissance of Rome. This neighborhood kind of planned out in the early 1500s and then built all through the 16th, 17th, and into the early 18th centuries. And let's see, we're looking out over the rooftops of the city, and there in the distance. On the horizon there, you can see the Dome of St. Peter's on Vatican Hill. Now these, these steps were planned out. There's a, a, a French guy who'd left money in, in his will to connect the square up to the French church on top. It didn't happen for quite a long time. Finally, uh, after a bit of squabbling between the papal administration in Rome and uh, the royal administration in Paris finally came to some agreements and these steps open up in the winter of 1725-26. It's built on three levels, three distinct levels. Well that uh, in itself is a kind of recognition of the church on top, the Holy Trinity. You have the three levels of the steps, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's pretty quiet these days. I mean, it's early, but it's not that early. There just aren't any visitors in town. I mean, here in Italy, we're not allowed to leave our regions unless we've got very specific purposes, limited even by law. Normally, the steps are, are quite crowded. People walking up and down. Uh, they won't let you sit anymore. They've decided they're a monument and they need to be shown proper respect at the, their steps. Why people can't walk up them. Even these, these sort of broad banisters that you see were specifically designed for people to sit and relax. Uh, just absorb... Plenty to do here in Rome, but for people who live here, the active verb is not do, but rather be. It's a tough town and uh, often requires work, two incomes, two jobs, whatever. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an expensive city for, for the levels of average income. 
and still uh, people work to live, not the other way around. It's in places like this. It's kind of interesting where you actually see Romans kind of reoccupying their city, spending time in places that normally they wouldn't, mainly to avoid the throngs of visitors. Difficult times to be sure, but people adapt. Romans have seen just about everything over the generations, centuries even. What Michelangelo does for uh, sculpture and architecture in the Renaissance, John Lorenzo Berrini does for it in the Baroque. He's not the only one, he's just probably, uh, well, he was the better businessman uh, compared to some of his rivals. And it's Bernini and his father, apparently, who designed this rather dramatic boat. And all through the Renaissance, even fountains, as they're redone, or we get redone, I should say aqueducts are repaired. Still plugging into the same sorts of uh, spring sources up in the mountains. Um, the hill country surrounding the city uh, before you get to the mountains Bringing water back into the city you know through ancient times there are about 12 uh, Aqueducts that ran into the city only one of them continued working all through the Middle Ages and with the Renaissance and the growth of population were uh, Reviving them, repairing old ones building new ones well this one uh, plugs into that single one built uh, toward the end of the first century BC that had worked all the way through the Middle Ages. You'll see uh, Renaissance era fountains that are throwbacks to ancient times. Grandiose bird baths on spectacular pedestals often combining ancient elements with new elements. This though is a little more theatrical. Yeah well Bernini is a little more theatrical. And look uh, that platform, how worn down it is. Well, for the last 400 years, people are going to fill up their pots, their pans, their pitchers, and now their plastic or hopefully uh, sustainable water containers. I mean, I do. This water is naturally filtered through limestone, high in calcium, good for your bones. how long and straight that street is. That's practically a super highway by European standards 500 years ago. As is this one down here. Well, the aqueducts, by the way, were running from up on the hill. Come down the hill into feed the fountain in the square uh, but they still had some pressure problems which is one of the reasons why Bernini and his dad kind of sink that thing down also apparently although this is as much urban legend as it is history perhaps even more urban legend uh, flooding of the river which happens quite frequently historically flooded this whole this whole area um, in the very early 1600s the entire ground floor of these buildings completely submerged. Uh, it was devastating for homes and businesses here. Which apparently is why this is reminiscent of a ship that had come unmoored on the docks on the river, comes floating right up the street, and as the waters recede, gets stuck in the middle of the square. Had to dismantle the thing to get it out. The Pope commissions this, this rather fanciful sunken ship, which the Romans call La Barcaccia. Uh, to commemorate that tragic event. We'll commemorate it rather nicely, I'd say. And fixing some of those pressure problems along the way by sinking a little bit further down. Then, of course, those conduits run all the way down the street to feed uh, the whole neighborhood here. In fact, if you look up, it's just BBC. The name of the street, Via dei Condotti, literally, Conduit Street. And this is, uh, you know, like 
Rome's Fifth Avenue, Gucci, Prada, over here on the right, Dolce Gabbana, Bulgari, I mean good for window looking anyway. Tiffany's is just around the corner, to get an idea what kind of neighborhood this is. And again, one of those streets that typically is pretty crowded with passers-by. Eh, a little quieter these days. Just waiting. Just waiting. It's all right. Rome's memory is long. She's good at waiting. This Antico Cafe Greco has been a cafe with the same name since 1760. A little bit of... Oh, look, there I am. A little bit of old world glory and they've got their own uh, coffee blend they make some of the most fantastic pastries in the city and they've got some pretty stiff competition hadn't changed that much in the last 150 years or so and the city now lets uh, these places to compensate for the the fact that everyone has to be rather socially distanced can't see as many people inside so what they've done is allowed people uh, these businesses all over the city to expand out into the street without charging them the usual fare now you can see right up there at the end of the street those Spanish steps so called only because the Spanish Embassy is a little bit further down in the square so it's uh, French money who pay for it, uh, Italian architects who design and build the stairway. Spanish don't do anything and they get the name. a little jog off the street here in a minute we'll see here's a uh, Armani bless that man he just keeps going and going and going and going uh, through these difficult times he's been quite vocal and present in his support of the city of Milan well, his career has been built on just how very good Milan has been to him. Different designers have, have different, uh, these different design houses have different cultures, I mean, depending on who the designer is. There are those, and this, you know, we could make this reference even with Michelangelo and Raphael. Uh, Raphael was a great delegator. Michelangelo was a control freak. We're just passing the, uh, the complex, the headquarters, really, of the Knights of Malta. Technically, Vatican City is the world's smallest country. About uh, half a square mile. This, you can see the Maltese cross inside the courtyard there, is a basically a country without any territory. It's a sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta. It's had many names along the way. That's a shortened version of one of the most recent names of it. When they're kicked out of Malta, it's an old crusading order. And when they're kicked out of Malta by the Turks, they got nowhere to go. Where do they go? They come to Rome and establish themselves here Invited, of course, by the Pope. You were passing Ferragamo. Well, these are elegant townhouses. And were built to be such. It's kind of a showcase neighborhood. Most people arriving in this city arrived at the north. 
that's kind of where we are. If you were standing in front of the Spanish Steps, which you see behind us, look up to the left, you'd be looking to the north into Piazza del Popolo. And the gates there, the northern end of the city, was the, the most common way for people to come in. Uh, many, many pilgrims, of course. And then lots of people on what was called the Grand Tour. And this starts really with, uh, with the English. The end of the 16th century, Queen Elizabeth I decides that some of her noblemen are a little too rough around the edges, these young men, send them to the continent to get some education, get some culture, learn them some manners, as my daddy might say. And these young gentlemen, I mean young, talking early 20s, would come not for a few weeks or a few months, but for a few years, traveling the ancient ports of call across the Mediterranean and end up in Rome. It was all about Rome. And they'd spend sometimes six to nine months just in this one city. This was the neighborhood they stayed. Not just the English, too. The French, of course, not to be outdone by the English, joined in pretty quickly, as did the Germans and the Dutch and the Poles and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Scandinavians. Here's a very, very late Baroque construction. And it's hard to see. I think you get a little slightly different angle. The whole facade is actually beveled out. And you can see the coat of arms way up at the top. This is a, a Spanish church sponsored called Holy Trinity of the, of the, uh, of the Spanish in uh, the early 18th century. Well, this is a time when Rococo is being born and developed in, in, in Paris, mostly. It's a very late Baroque style. And high Baroque is quite masculine, you know, coursing with testosterone. Rococo is quite feminine. Swoopy, swervy, curvy. Uh, Rome doesn't really do feminine. It's a terribly misogynistic, has been for a long time. Changing, only very slowly though. This is about as much as they'll do to reflect the elegance uh, of, of Rococo. Not Rococo at all, but perhaps a reaction to it, a response to it, a development of their own extension of the Baroque style. And to see what that looks like on the inside, you can join me for my grand tour, virtual tour. Yes, that was a shameless plug. Now here we're approaching Via del Corso. This has been the main drag coming into the city, running more or less north to south, since way before Julius Caesar. And up ahead there, at the end of the street, we're looking into Piazza del Popolo. Now all of this is, is redone. Older buildings knocked down, almost completely rebuilt in the 19th century with these elegant later 19th century, sometimes early 20th century townhouses. The Plaza Hotel. You walk in there and you feel like you're walking into a film set. And on the other side of the street, this is the church of San Carlo e Sant'Ambrogio. The Milanese Lombard the region of Lombardy. Like this is the Lombard National Church. And I say national because keep in mind, Italy is a nation only for the last barely 150 years. Before that, you know, duchies, counties, principalities, kingdoms, republics, the papal states, the whole central third of the Italian peninsula are the papal states. Rome's the capital, Pope's the king. 
and you had representation of these various nations here in Rome. All this is a stunning piece of architecture. From the 17th century. And you never know what's going to be open these days, by the way, just because you know, people are being careful. There's restricted openings, restricted opening hours. This one is open, though. Let's go take a look. His nosebleed high baroque. That art and architectural form born here in the city of Rome. So often these individual chapels are added later. Or, with time, that happens through most of the Middle Ages, you get the middle aisle, an aisle on each side, and then a noble family would acquire, which of course means give money for, the right to sort of add on the outside by blowing a hole in the outside wall and then adding a chapel, decorating it as they saw fit. And then with time, these construction projects would, would plan ahead for that and then build basic structures on the outside and then sell them off to these noble families, which is where they would uh, assemble their dearly departed. But that's exactly what you see along the walls are funerary monuments for family members. And sometimes they would change hands, you know, Dad dies, son inherits the title, but also inherits dad's gambling debts. Uh, sell off a couple of chapels. Your dearly departed get moved out. Somebody else does get moved in, and they redecorate according to the new taste of the times. Here there is a deliberate, specific reference, though completely different in style to the Duomo in Milan. Well, this is the Lombard National Church. One might expect such a reference. And that reference is to what's called the perambulatory. Well, oh, that is breathtaking. Perambulatory, a walk around, literally is what that means. And you see this in Gothic churches. The Duomo in Milan is a, indeed a Gothic construction. The perambulatory, this walk around behind the altar, the idea is that, you know, the offices, as they call them, could be taking place. Masses of various types. And pilgrims could come, pay their respects, light their candles, drop in their offerings, their prayer requests, without disturbing. You can imagine the sound put out by these pipes. Half of them are there, the other half are right over top of my head. If any of you have been to, say, uh, Notre Dame in Paris, you'll see exactly this kind of perambulatory. Here we're directly behind the main altar in the curved space of the apse before it flips around and goes back in the other direction.
the floors have been recently waxed. You can probably hear my shoes squeaking. And these are the sorts of the things that when we're actually broadcasting live, we can't really do. Often because the reception in these old structures is non-existent and you lose the connection. The other thing is that, you know, we're usually filming, if we're doing it live, we're doing it in the evening. Well, it's still winter, so it gets dark quite early. The days are getting a little longer, but still, when we're talking about the east coast of the U.S. that's six hours behind us, the west coast of the U.S. that's nine hours behind us, we can't really broadcast any earlier than, than the evening. By doing it this way, you got a little more, a little more flexibility. And we can go inside some of these places. I think we'll take a little jog off onto a side street here. Oh, here you can see some 18th century additions. Well, uh, a lot of the buildings further back in the neighborhood Again, we're all built, uh, some in the 15, most in the 1600s. And then in the 1700s, they added uh, another floor. You can really see it on these buildings over here. They add another floor up at the top. So even when buildings are built in the 19th century, they kind of keep that up. Of course, those are the, that's the most expensive property with your own private rooftop gardens. People are moving around a little bit now. There are a few places in town I'll stop in for a Guinness when my partly Irish soul needs one. This is one of them right here. It's just off the just off the path, just off the way, and it's far more people who live here stopping in than people visiting. As those of you who've been uh, following us all along, or if you've been to Rome, you know that it's 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 like architectural lasagna. We've been using the same space over and over and over and over. Building things around previous things, over previous things. And you just keep going. Sometimes there are references. Like, well, you see it on these two corners. The one that we're walking up to, the corner of Via del Arancio. See that little thing right there on the corner of the building? Another one just up ahead. In ancient times, uh, there were lots of places that were considered sacred. Um, gateways, doorways, thresholds, intersections. And uh, you would often have altars on corners. And you'd have a holy man or holy woman uh, hanging around, burning incense, with lots of beads and other kinds of religious paraphernalia around. And you would drop a few coins 
so that they would say a prayer to the Lares, these sort of local god. Think of, um, like, oh, it's not the best example, but like leprechauns in Irish mythology, in, in Celtic mythology, or or uh, in Scandinavian mythology, trolls. They're, they're not uh, gods, per se, but they are, they are not humans. They're these sort of otherworldly beings that live right here in this world. And they could cause mischief, or they could help you along, depending on their mood. Or depending on whether or not you gave the little holy person money to say a prayer to them, to honor those, those little local mini-deities. It was perfectly normal to have fountains for ablutions and such. And here we retain exactly that tradition. And this little fountain, right underneath. Uh, these are, um, they're in Rome. They're almost always Mary. Or Mary and baby Jesus. Or Mary and baby Jesus and a saint, for example. Uh, and it depends on where you are. The different ones in different cities. In Rome, it, it's principally Mary. And you can see how how the sky is cleared up there. I'll take it. You know, I don't mind the rain. I don't mind the clouds. You know, the variation is nice, but you know, if you let me choose, I'm gonna pick the nice blue clear skies with a bright warm sun. preferred modes of transportation in this town. Motorini. Scooters. And here I think uh, one of the more elegant squares in the center of the city. Where you'll see bikes. And these crazy little uh, motorized things that have infested the center of the city like fleas, uh, but they are handy. Now there's a church just up ahead. One of the oldest churches in Christendom. Uh, apparently built over the home of a woman who uh, lived there, a wealthy woman, who then uh, allowed some of the space in her home to be used for Christians to worship even before Christianity was legal, when people were still dying for their faith. It's called San Lorenzo Lucina, San Lorenzo, St. Lawrence, uh, a local boy martyred here in Rome. But San Lorenzo Lucina because apparently Lucina was this this woman's name and so of course the whole square keeps that name and you can you can see the the dimensions of the square it's quite large and people doing what one does on a weekend morning let the kids run around in a space where there's no traffic and have a hobbit style second breakfasts cappuccino cornetto a pastry I mean, this, this pastry shop has been here, uh, Viti, since 1898. And uh, I think that's probably a pretty good place to stop. Uh, partly because I'm ready for a coffee myself. So I hope you've enjoyed our little walk. Keep uh, keep tuned in for walks that we'll have coming out. Take a look also at our, our list of virtual tours, which has grown to about 40 now. We've got plenty of options. And until we can all travel again, arrivederci a Roma. Ciao.